one of the names of the goal of the practice that the Buddha gave is security, a place of safety. A haven, harbor, refuge. All of these are synonyms for nirvana. Because as the Buddha said, we live in a world of dangers. There's aging, illness, death, separation. We live in a world where we have to make choices in our actions, and sometimes we make bad choices, especially if the mind isn't trained. Even sometimes we think we're acting on good intentions, but it turns out they're not especially skillful. That notion of being skillful is central to the practice. When the Buddha was talking about his search for awakening, he would often phrase it as the search for what is skillful. The Pali term is gusala. Sometimes it's translated as wholesome, but that doesn't quite capture the meaning. You probably know the passage where the Buddha is talking to a young monk who was very delicately brought up. The story goes is that he was so delicately brought up that he had hair on the soles of his feet. The king heard about this and he wanted to see, this is pretty strange, I'd like to see this. So he gets an invitation to visit the king. The parents receive the invitation and they, they know exactly why the king is inviting the son. So they take him aside and say, there's only one reason he wants to see you. He wants to see the hair on the soles of your feet. And so, when you go into the palace, don't stick out your feet in front of you. That would be impolite. But just sit in full lotus position. And the king can see the soles of your feet at a glance. So that's what the young man did. And at the end of his talk, the king said, well, I've talked to you about worldly matters now. He had been dressing not only the young man, but other people as well. Now go see the Buddha. He'll talk to you about your, your welfare, not only in this lifetime, but also in the next. So the young man went to listen to the Buddha. He was inspired by the Buddha's talk and decided to, to ordain. But because he was so delicately brought up when he was doing walking meditation, his, the soles on his feet began to bleed. And he began to get discouraged. He had been putting a lot of effort in and didn't have anything to show for it. So he was thinking of disrobing. At that point, the Buddha was reading his mind. So he levitated from the top of Ultra Peak and appeared right in front of the young man. I don't know how, what you think, but the idea of thinking something unskillful in your meditation, all of a sudden the Buddha appears in front of you. So were you thinking of this? That's what he said to the young man. And the young man said, yes. And then the Buddha gave the analogy of the lute. You know, the one where it says, if the strings are too tight, it doesn't sound right. If the strings are too loose, it doesn't sound right. Try to find what the point of just right. In this case, the level of energy you're able to put in. And apparently the lute back in those days had five strings. And he said, to that you can tune the other strengths, starting with your level of energy. Tune that string first, and then from there you tune your conviction and your mindfulness, your concentration, and your discernment. So they all, they all sound in tune to one another, and then you pick up your theme of meditation. But he prefaced his mark, remarks to the young man. He said, before I gave the analogy, he said, when you're a young layperson, were you skilled at playing the lute? And the word he used, skilled, was gusala. He not, was not asking, Are you? did you play wholesome songs on your lute? He said, was, were you skilled? And that's the love of what the practice is, is developing skills so that you can deal with a dangerous situation and not feel overwhelmed. Now, as the Buddha said, the basis for skillfulness is not in any innate goodness or wholesomeness in the mind. It's in the quality of heedfulness, i.e. seeing the dangers that exist out there, that if you don't master the skill, you're going to put, let yourself be open to dangers. If you do master the skill, you can have a good chance of avoiding them. It's that quality of heedfulness is what underlies the whole practice. There are dangers there, not only in aging, illness, and death, but in the fact that we are making choices. Our actions have the power to shape our lives. 
And if we're not paying full attention to what we're doing, and if we don't really care about doing things skillfully, we can create a lot of trouble, both for ourselves and for the people around us. And so the Buddha, you, know, you may have noticed, illustrates a lot of his points about how to meditate, how to practice, by making analogies to skills, the skills of an archer, the skills of a cook. the skills of a chariot driver, even the skills of a farmer, the skills of a soldier. The types of manual skills where you really do make the difference between starving and not starving, winning and losing. And so it's good to think about your practice as a process of mastering skills. This is not only in the Pali text, you also see this in the teachings of the Ajahns. We hear so much about how the practice is one of letting go. But there are also things you have to hold on to. Letting go is something that you have to do with skill, realizing that some things don't let go, should not be let go of until the very last part of the path. Other things should be let go of pretty quickly. And although sometimes it's difficult to let go, one of the problems is we let go of things that we haven't yet mastered. In other words, saying, well, I'll just content myself that I don't have good concentration or that my virtues are not perfect. That kind of contentment is not the contentment that the Buddha recommended. As he said, one of the secrets to his awakening was discontent with regard to the extent of his own skill. The contentment he taught had more to do with physical surroundings. You're content with your food, your clothing, your shelter as long as these things are conducive to the practice. But when you get to the mind, you have to learn how to deal with the fact that there are dangers in the mind and you have to learn skills in order to prevent them from causing that danger. There are potentials there. And learn how to do this with a sense of balance and not get neurotic or fearful about it, but just simply being matter of fact. There was a book by Barry Lopez called Arctic Dreams. And that was one of the qualities he said he noticed in the Inuit that he was living with. That they were alert to the fact that there were dangers all around them all the time, and yet they learned how to live with that with a sense of stability and calm, because they had mastered various skills that helped them, that would prepare them to deal with dangers. So we're working on a skill here, which means you work on developing good qualities and hold on to them. The Ajahns will give analogies for this. Ajahn Mahabhu's analogy is climbing the ladder to a roof of a house. You hold on to one rung, and then you hold on to the one higher. And only when you've held on tight to the higher one do you let go of the lower one so you can reach up to the next one up. When you've got well, that one grasped, you reach for the next one up and keep going up from one attachment to another. And finally you get to the roof of the house, that's when you let go. And John Fung's analogy was of a rocket going to the moon. When I went to first stay with him, this was not long after the American moonshots. And he said the practice is like the rockets going to the moon. You have the, the booster. And then when the booster has gotten you away from the earth, you drop the booster. And then there's the second stage, that takes you further, then you drop that. And then you let go of everything else so that the capsule can get to the moon. And John Lee's image was of learning to let go like a rich person. He said a poor person lets go of wealth before he even has it. And as a result, he's left poor. Like I say, I, I, have, I don't have a Cadillac, so I let go of my Cadillac. But you don't have any transportation. So what you do is you work to develop the wealth, and then you let it go. Otherwise you're not carrying it around. It's there for you to draw on when you need it. And he gave the example of the Buddha. The Buddha, even though in the moment of his awakening, let go of virtue and concentration and discernment, he still had these things after his awakening. It's just that he didn't have to carry them around.
So there's a John Cha's image. You're coming back from market carrying a banana. Someone comes and asks you, why are you carrying the banana? You say, I'm going to eat it. Then he says, are you going to eat the peel? No. Then why are you carrying the peel? At that point, John Cha stops and says, with what are you going to answer this question? And his response had two levels. The first level is that you answer with desire. In other words, to give a good answer, you have to want to give a good answer. And then, of course, the good answer is because the time hasn't come to let go of the peel. If I let go of the peel, the banana will become mush in my hands. In the same way in your practice, you hold on to virtue, you hold on to concentration, you hold on to discernment. Because if you don't, your mind will become mush in your hands. So always keep in mind that there are things you have to hold on to, even as you're letting go of what's relatively unskillful. You can see this particularly in the Buddhist teachings on what he calls noble wealth. All too often we're warned against spiritual materialism, but the Buddha himself often would talk about the practice as one of investing. As with any investment, you want it to be safe. You put your energy into things that will be long-lasting. So when the time comes to make sacrifices, you sacrifice what is inessential, hold on to what is essential. And that way you can be safe. There's a statement that's written across the, the gates of the various military camps in Thailand. It says, be willing to sacrifice one of your limbs for the sake of saving your body. Be willing to sacrifice your life for the sake of your virtue. Once we realize we live in a world where we will have to lose things, but you want to make sure you don't lose the things that are of real value. So you invest in the things of real value. So when the time comes that you do have to lose other things, you're not set adrift. So what are those noble treasures? The first one is conviction, i.e. conviction in the Buddha's awakening. And that translates into conviction and the idea that a human being has the capacity to find true happiness. And as in the Buddha's case, he found true happiness, not because he was a god or he had any special superhuman qualities. He had human qualities that we all have in potential form, but he developed them. Wisdom, compassion, purity, heedfulness, resolve, ardency. So to have conviction in the Buddha's awakening means that you have conviction in these qualities, that these are the ones that will see you through to true happiness. And building on that is virtue. You take up the precepts as promises to yourself. That under no circumstances at all are you going to break them. Some people complain about the precepts being like hard and fast rules, but I think it's better to think of them as being clear-cut instructions. Because when the temptation comes to kill or steal or have illicit sex, or to lie. That comes usually in the heat of the moment. And it's a time like at a time like that you don't need long drawn out disquisitions with lots of potential excuses. And it's good to remember no, no, no. It's like the instructions they give for dealing with bears. You see a bear, don't run. I mean your immediate imp impulse will be to run. So always keep in mind, don't run. And also remind yourself of the Buddha's very interesting observation, which is that to harm yourself means to break the precepts. 
to harm someone else means to get them to break the precepts. Because what you're getting them to do is to act in unskillful ways that will come back and harm them for a long time to come. So you hold the precepts, you recommend to others when it's appropriate, i.e. when it's appropriate they're going to listen to you, to get them to hold the precepts. If you have children, make sure that this is something they really hold on to. That way, as the Buddha said, you give universal safety. You can't protect everybody in the world, but you can make sure that in, there's no danger from your quarter toward anyone. And as you say, when you give universal safety to others, you have a share in that universal safety yourself. Now, to support your precepts are two other qualities, two other treasures, which are shame and Compunction. Shame here is not the opposite of pride, it's the opposite of shamelessness. One of the definitions of shame is that there's a desire to look good in the eyes of other people. Well, you want to make sure which other people have the eyes that you want to look good in, i.e., you want to look good in the eyes of the wise. So you're not going to do or say anything that would be shameful in that sense. This actually is connected not with low self-esteem, but actually high self-esteem. The realization that certain types of behavior are beneath you. Connected with that is compunction, which is basically the desire not to cause harm. This is the opposite of apathy. You see that your actions will have results and you want to avoid creating any harm for anybody. The other three treasures are generosity, a fund of knowledge, i.e. a fund of knowledge of the Dharma, and discernment. That fund of knowledge of the Dharma is something that gets overlooked often. You listen to the Dharma, you read the Dharma, try to keep it in mind. Sometimes it's good to memorize passages of the Dharma, especially ones that you find relevant to your life. I have a student down at the monastery who studied Spanish in Mexico. He was part of an exchange program. And soon after the students arrived from Texas, the Mexican hosts had a party. And the Mexican students sang Mexican folk songs. And then they turned to the Americans and asked for some American folk songs. And the Americans looked at one another and they didn't know any folk songs. All they knew was commercial jingles and theme songs for Gilligan's Island. So that's what they sang. So as you're going through life, you don't want to have Gilligan's Island going through your, through your mind. <clears throat> it's better to have passages of the Dharma. This is why we chant, this is why we repeat things, this is why we memorize passages. So they're kind of there in the background. And you can draw on them when you need to. You may have seen the book Awareness Itself. It actually came from my experience after John Fuang passed away. The first year after his passing, there was a lot of conflict in the monastery. People came into the monastery from other places and were trying to take it over. I was there. I was the one fighting them off. It was a difficult position to be in, the lone, the lone Westerner. But as I was dealing with these problems, these passages or comments that John Fung had made would come to my mind to help give guidance. And it was his teachings that actually saw me through. I began to realize, I don't want to forget these, so I started writing them down. And from there I started collecting other people's memories of what John Fung had said, and that's how we got the book. But it was that experience of being able to depend on a fund of Dharma that made me realize how important it is to have that in your mind, and not just 
commercial jingles and whatnot and sloshing around. So these are things you protect, these treasures, because that's where you find safety. And you try to master them as skills. And as for letting go, you let go of the other things, the things that would pull you away from developing these qualities. For example, with virtue, the Buddha talks about different kinds of loss, and he says there's loss of relatives, loss of wealth, loss of your health. He says that's not, that's near, not nearly as serious as loss of your virtue and loss of your, your discernment, your right view. Which means there will come times when you have to make a choice. Are you going to hold to your discernment, or are you going to be, excuse me, hold to your virtue, or are you going to have to risk your health? There are times when you have to go without if you actually hold to your precepts. But as he says, you drop your precepts, you've dropped something of real value, a real protection. So hold on to that. You apply your contemplation of what's inconstant, stressful, and not self to the other things that you might lose, the other things that would might pull you into breaking the precepts. The same with concentration. I've read a number of people saying that, you know, if you're concentrated on one object, that means you're attached to that object, which is a bad thing. You should learn how you should learn non-attachment. Or by developing concentration, you're putting investment into how the mind is going to develop in the future, and that's going to involve a sense of self, and you let go of your sense of self, don't worry about the concentration. This is all very wrong-headed. Concentration is part of the peel of the banana. It's one of the rungs of the ladder. It's one of the booster rockets. You hold on to it as long as you need to. If you drop the booster rocket before you get off the earth, you're never going to get off the earth. If you let go of the rungs of the ladder, you fall back onto the ground. So you apply the analysis of inconstant, stressful, and non-self to the things that would pull you away. You learn to look at the disadvantages of the distracting thoughts. Learn to ignore the distracting thoughts. Begin to realize that the energy that goes into a distracting thought can be relaxed. You do what you can to let go of the distractions so you can hold on to your concentration. The same goes with discernment. You hold on to right view. You hold on to the use of the three perceptions of inconstant stressful and not self when it's appropriate. And only when they've done their work do you let them go. Again, a common image in the forest tradition is of making a piece of furniture. While you're working on the furniture, you hold on to your saw, you hold on to your hammer, or you pick them up and hold on to them when you need them. But when the job is done, you put them all down. But you don't put them down until the job is done. Another example from Ajahn Mahabur. He was asked one time whether nirvana was self or not self. This came at a time when there was a one of the cults north of Bangkok had been teaching that nirvana was your true self. And a lot of scholarly monks in Bangkok came out and said, no, 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 nirvana is not self. And the controversy became so heated that it actually appeared in the newspapers. Can you imagine USA Today? writing in one of those editorials where there's a pro and the con, one side, nirvana is self, and no, no, nirvana is not self. But that's what you had in the newspapers in Thailand. So someone asked Ajahn Mahabua, is nirvana self or not self? He said, nirvana is nirvana. And then he explained, we use the teachings on self, the self as its own mainstay, the self as its governing principle. 
when you need them. You use the teachings on not-self as part of the path. He says they're like stairways leading up to your house. But once you get into the house, you drop both. You don't need the stairway anymore. There will come a point where you let go of everything. But if you don't have the stairway, you're not going to get into the house. So it's these practices that form our safety. These are the things we rely on. And they can give us confidence that even though there are dangers all around us, we're born into this world, we're full of dangers. If you have children, you have to realize you're bringing the children into a dangerous world. As much as you would like to assure them that mommy and daddy will take everything, maybe mommy and daddy might not be there. So it's a dangerous world. But if we can train in these skills, if we're heedful of the dangers, i.e. see the dangers but not get overwhelmed by them, realize that there are ways of protecting ourselves from the dangers so that nothing of real value gets damaged. And there is something of real value to our minds. Sometimes you hear the, the idea that Buddha taught the principle of what some people call corelessness, and there's no real core to your personality, it's just phenomena coming and going. The Buddha never taught that. He says there is a core, the core is release. This has real value. So everything you can protect that leads in that direction, that has value as well. That's where your safety lies, that's where your true happiness will lie. Even as you have to give up lots and lots of other things. Have a clear idea of what your priorities are, where true safety lies. And that way you can face the dangers of aging, illness, death, all the possibilities of choices you have to make. With the confidence you can protect what is of genuine value. The unshakable release of the mind. <clears throat>